You know, why do the Greeks not have zero? Why did the Gothic culture and the Western culture, you know, have infinity as something? So uh, fascinating to see. They didn't have that word back then. We didn't use paradigms as a word back then, but now it's pretty common, you know, commonplace. But the fact that your belief system is affecting perception or form of performance all the time. So I've always been fascinated by that. And then how, how if you got a hold of that, how you could see things you hadn't seen before, how you could make things happen with as little effort as possible you hadn't seen before. How, you know, how, do, you, how do you do that? I figured if you could get a hold of what's invisible and how that's affecting everything we're doing and get a, a grip on that and how it works, you'd have the master key. Once you have the space to think, how do you unlock your creative potential? This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. I'm here to help you cut out the noise to focus. Almost 15 years ago, getting things done started taking the internet by storm. Techies started buying binder clips and index cards in bulk. Today, next actions and contexts are commonplace in teams around the world. Just about everyone knows GTD stands for getting things done. When I was trying to deal with wearing multiple hats as a designer in an architecture firm, I absorbed some GTD through osmosis to get on top of my daily tasks. And a few years later, when I finally listened to the audiobook for GTD, I could feel my brain being re-architected. I captured everything that was on my mind, and I developed a habit of doing a weekly review, and suddenly my creative energy was unleashed, and so was my energy for thinking about the bigger picture, like what I wanted out of my life and my career. Millions of people have been impacted by GTD in this way. It's all thanks to our guest today. After more than 20 years as a productivity consultant, David Allen finally put his knowledge into book form with Getting Things Done, which came out way back in 2001. Since then, he's taken GTD Global with certified GTD consultants all over the world. One of his top people even lives not too far from me down in Colombia. Here's what we'll talk about in this conversation. GTD helps clear the space in your head for creative work. But what about actually getting creative work done? We'll learn how David used GTD to actually write getting things done. GTD also helps clear your mind from making big life decisions. How did David use GTD to decide to move from the US to Amsterdam a few years ago? GTD suggests a lot of paper for keeping track of things. So what does David think about digital management of GTD? And when you're trying to get things done, having to run errands can make you feel like you're chained up in a straitjacket. The worst errand of all has to be going to the post office. I can't think of a less effective use of my time and energy getting there, standing in line, and inevitably forgetting something at my office. That's why there's SendPro from Pitney Bowes. With SendPro, you can compare prices from different carriers and buy postage straight from your browser. No special equipment required, no special software required. SendPro has three times the features of stamps.com for one third the price. Visit pb.com slash loveyourwork and try it free for 90 days. That's PB as in peanut butter or Pitney Bowes, pb.com slash loveyourwork. When you're trying to get things done, you don't want to worry about your clothes. I picked up a shirt from Pistol Lake back when they did their Kickstarter, and I love it so much, I invited them to sponsor the show. They spent two years just engineering the yarn for this shirt. It's made from a soft, stretchable, wrinkle-free, and stink-free blend of recycled bottles and eucalyptus tree pulp, and they're entirely made in the USA. Go to pistollake.com slash loveyourwork now and pick up their minimalist shirt. They're giving Love Your Work listeners 10% off with a promo code loveyourwork. Wear it for 100 days. If you don't love it, they'll refund it. No questions asked. They'll even cover return shipping. That's pistollake.com slash loveyourwork. Use the code loveyourwork. And we hit a new milestone recently. Love Your Work now has over 400,000 downloads. And this milestone kind of snuck up on me. I just looked at it the other day and it was just about to hit 400,000. We hit 250,000 downloads back in February and we're almost averaging 30,000 downloads a month. And we had a record month in June with over 32,000 downloads. And that was helped a lot by being featured on the front page of iTunes and by the Seth Godin episode. So if we stretch a bit, if we grow a little faster than usual, I think we can hit half a million downloads by November. Half a million downloads is a lot of downloads. One of the best, one of the easiest and best things you can do to help us hit that goal 
is to subscribe and not just anywhere. Subscribe if you can on Apple Podcasts or on iTunes, ideally on both. Subscribe on every piece of Apple hardware you have, your iPhone, your iPad, your MacBook, your Apple TV, your Apple car. If you happen to be listening to this in the future and there's an Apple car and I wonder if it flies, the reason is this. You folks are too cool. About 30% of you listen to Love Your Work on Overcast. And that's awesome. I personally do most of my podcast listening on Overcast too. And I'm sure you're hitting the star on episodes you like, and I'm sure that's recommending the episodes to your friends. But only about half of you are listening on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. I say only because most people listen to podcasts on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. It's a much higher number for most podcasts, something like 70 or 80% of all podcast listeners instead of 50% listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. So Love Your Work has a lot of so-called early adopters. So the popularity of this show is not reflected in the Apple ecosystem. So the way to get more listeners is through Apple Podcasts. So let me tell you a little bit about how that ecosystem works because it's something that I've examined a lot. And it's interesting for anyone who makes things and then tries to get that message out, which is many of you. So there are two reasons subscriptions are so important. Category rankings and search. Okay. First, category rankings. The rankings of podcasts are determined from what I can tell and I've heard from people with access to data that nobody else has access to. The rankings are determined by the number of subscribers a podcast has. So right now, Love Your Work is number 24 in careers and careers is a subcategory of business. That's actually an amazing ranking. Lately, it's usually been somewhere around 100. And in the business category, we're currently at 161. That is also good. We're usually not even in the top 200, so not on the charts at all. And these rankings are probably high right now because somehow we've gotten a lot of new subscribers in the past few days. Rankings are also weighted by recency. So the more recently we've gotten new subscribers, the higher our ranking will be. So as time goes on, the rankings drop back down if you don't have new subscribers. And so if you look in the business category right now, my guess is that we're probably nowhere to be seen in the top charts. These rankings are where people look for new podcasts to listen to. So it helps to be ranked well if you want to hit half a million by November. Next is search. We have many big guests who people search for. People search for Jason Fried or James Altucher or Seth Godin, just to name a few. David Allen, our guest today, will be one such person. And now the search in Apple Podcasts and iTunes is uh, not sophisticated. It is not Google. It is not even Yahoo circa 1995. It really boils down to the title of the episode. And guess what else? That's right. How many subscribers does the podcast have? So while the Seth Godin episode is simply titled Seth Godin, and even though that is the most revealing Seth Godin conversation I've personally ever heard, there are several other podcasts that rank higher. And this is simply because they have more subscribers within the Apple Podcasts ecosystem. And again, Apple Podcasts at this moment is not sophisticated. If it were Google, they'd probably be taking into account things like how much of a particular episode people listen to. Instead, they use the number of subscribers to help them rank searches. So this is why even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, if you want to help us hit half a million downloads sooner please subscribe on as many Apple devices as you can. I know it's silly. It's counterproductive. You could even call it manipulative. But hey, podcast discovery, the way people find podcasts is really broken. This is still a young medium. Unfortunately for now, this is how it works. Apple doesn't have more sophisticated ways to reflect the popularity of a podcast. So please subscribe on your Apple devices. I appreciate it so much. Okay, we are about to start, but... First, I want to thank our new Love Your Work Elite members. Thank you, Stacey Arellano, Rich Pearson, Martin M., and Renee Gross. Oh, lots of new members this week. Your membership is so appreciated. You can learn more about Love Your Work Elite at lywelite.com. Now, David Allen. So I'm here with David Allen, author of Getting Things Done. And David, I've been reviewing Getting Things Done in preparation for this interview. I first read it probably 10 years ago. And it's great. It's it's just changing my life all over again. And one of the things that I noticed from reading the book is that I'm getting like this burst of creative energy. And is that something that you see a lot? And if so, what do you think causes that? 
Well, you need space, not time. And uh, it doesn't take any time to be creative or to have a good idea or to be innovative. Those, but they require room in your psyche. So what this methodology does that I uncovered just gives you space. How you use the space is up to you. But invariably, it creates space. And once you create space, you are an energetic being. And so more space, the, the, the energy sort of shows up automatically. I've, I've had people, you know, when I've coached them two or three days, one-on-one desk side, you know, with this applying this stuff, I've had people lose five pounds. Just because the energy that shows up when you free up this space and stop the the buzz that's going on and the spin that's going on inside of most people's heads makes a huge difference. And energy is a natural uh, occurrence. Yeah, that's an interesting observation that you uh, when you said that um, it doesn't take any time to to, to have an idea, right? Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of like what when, when I was writing uh, my first book and I was. It was my first time writing a book. I was banging my head against the wall 12 hours a day. But then I would get like this 15 minute, I would hit these 15 minute, you know, parts of flow. And I just thought, why, why can't I just do that all the time? Like it doesn't, it doesn't take any time to have the creative, the creativity come out of you. It just, uh, if you create the right conditions, then, then you, then it works. So it sounds like getting things done is kind of creating the right conditions for, for creativity well, to I happen. Think I- you know, come on, David, I think there is a muse, you know, who's going to just trick us no matter what, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> show up or not show up. Uh, but I think you can create a condition where it's easier to recognize the muse and easier to, to produce the invitation for the muse. So mm-hmm. people have often said, gee, David, your stuff is like mindfulness. Is this like a spiritual thing? So no, not, not, well, everything is spiritual. So if you look at it that way, sure. But it's really about how do I free up my attention? How do I free up the distractions? How do I get space? So if you have a spiritual thrust or a creative thrust or whatever, and you want more space, this provides that. If you, if you still have a cat and you need cat food, you know, I need cat food. If that pops at your head more than once, you're, you're, you're inappropriately engaged with your cat. And, you know, it's gonna, and it's taking up mental real estate you know, that, that could be used for other things. And to be able to then walk into a room where there's nothing there, I mean, it's such a great place to be creative. I mean, so you have this spiritual thrust, you have this creative thrust in the, in the case of like cre- creative work. And the fact that you have to get cat food is like this little rubber band that goes right across your path. <laughs> and yeah. along with all the other things that are going on in your in your brain at the time and just and, sends you back. And the weird thing about it, David, is that 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 I need cat food will take up about the same kind of mental real estate if it's just in your head as I need a life or I need a wife or I need to restructure my 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 job or I need a new job or whatever. And those things, any of them wake you up at three o'clock in the morning. So your head is just a crappy office. And that's the problem with most people these days is they're still trying to use their head as their office, as a place to try to remember, remind, even prioritize. And your head did not evolve to do that. It evolved to do some very cool things that keep you alive on the savannah or in the jungle. You know, recognized lions and tigers and thunderstorms and berries and and food and and whatever. And it it does that brilliantly, better than any computer can do yet. Uh, But you go to the store to buy lemons and, and you come back with six things and no lemons. What happened? <laughs> you tried to trust your brain was a remembering and reminding machine, and it doesn't do that. And that's the problem is that, that that space inside your head doesn't seem to have any sense of past or future. So you tell yourself you would, could, should, need to, ought to do any of those things, whether that's buy lemons or get a new job or get tires on your car or handle the next holiday or you know whatever the heck it is. And those things, you know, as they lie in your psyche, then – think there's a part of you subliminally that thinks you should be doing all of them all the time. That's why people are, are burning out. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and this is why I'm excited to have you here today, because I think that this sort of burst of creative energy is something that a lot of our listeners can can get from learning about getting things done. And I'm sure that many of the listeners uh, are already familiar with it, already practicing it. And as I've learned, it doesn't hurt to have a bit of a review. So what are kind of like the basic, <laughs> most important elements of getting things done? Keep everything potentially meaningful out of your head 
in some trusted bucket, sooner than later, empty those buckets by deciding exactly what you're going to do about them, if anything. Park the results of that thinking in some sort of a trusted system where you can be reminded of what you need to be reminded of when you need to be reminded of it. And then sit back and review that whole gestalt of all your commitments at all these different levels on some consistent basis. So you just make trusted choices about what you do instead of just being driven by latest and loudest. Yeah, so you, you get the things out of your head. You capture them in some way. And, um, and then you, you, you clarify them and then you organize and reflect and engage. Yep. It's that, and, and it's, that's how you get your kitchen under control. If you have friends coming over for dinner, you, you come home and it looks like it's been attacked or you forgot to clean up last night because it was a late night or whatever. You know, that's where you, first of all, you recognize what's off. That's the capture function. You say, then what is that? Is that a dirty dish, a clean dish? Is that good food, bad food? That's a clarified step. You then organize, you put the dirty dishes where they go. You put the good food back in the fridge, et cetera. Then you step back and reflect. You look at the whole game and look at the time. When these folks coming over, what am I going to cook? And then you pull out butter and melt it. So those, that's how you get your kitchen under control. It's how you get your consciousness under control. Just very few people do those as consistent behaviors. And you have to do that with the things that are in your consciousness. And I think that one of the most powerful concepts for me was the concept of the next action. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that it's, is being, <laughs> what's so, what's so funny is David is, is it's so mundane. It is the most mundane thing. And that's why it's so terrifying for people. It's like, okay, what the heck are you going to do about the relationship with your partner or your whatever that's not working? What's the next step? Oh God. You mean I have to, would have to make some decision about that? Oh, okay. Just sit there and be a victim of it. Be, go my, be my guest. And so actually making decisions about what are the things that I actually need to do if I were going to move the needle on resolving or clarifying or taking advantage of an opportunity or any of that stuff. And it's funny because the, the next action is the, is the first time you're going to have to put up or shut up. You know, you can think about stuff forever and still feel like you're a smart, intelligent, wonderfully productive person, but you get it down to, okay, now I actually have to take an action about this. <laughs> it's like, whoops. Okay. Now you got to put up or shut up. And that's why, interestingly, it is such a profound event is to, you know, get your life down to that level of mundanity. I, I wrote an essay about that called the, the Magic of the Mundane. It's like once you get it down to that level, it's amazing how many things free up for you. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's transformative. The, the moment that you um, decide to, to think about what the next act, you know, not having your list, your, your list just says mom. And what that is supposed to mean to you is that your, your mom's birthday is coming up. Um, and you're supposed to get a gift and it, it just becomes this, this block on your consciousness. But then when you decide, oh, well I could, uh, you know, call my sister and find out what she thinks about what mom might, might like, then suddenly you have an action. And once you do, once you do that action, then you start thinking about the next one. Well, suddenly what you do is you put yourself in the driver's seat instead of in the victim role. See, all that stuff yells at you until you engage with it appropriately. Hmm. All that stuff sitting around, anybody listening to this, what's sitting around in your desk, on your desk, in your desk, under your desk, around your desk, in your, in your life, what's, you know, come on in your apartment, in your house, you know, walk around, what's yelling at you? that you've gone numb to because it keeps yelling at you, change me, handle me, deal with me, fix me, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, what's, what's interesting is that <clears throat> all those noises, uh, <clears throat> when you begin to recognize, wait a minute, where's that noise coming from? And then how do I handle that? It, it gets you back into the, as opposed to being the victim to those things yelling at you from your desk you know, or your easel or your, <laughs> or your, or, or your drawing pad or whatever, you know, come on. If they're yelling at you, your computer's saying, hey, you know, handle me, deal with me, have a creative idea about me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And all those things, interestingly, we're the victims of our own creativity. So you're, you know, we're the people who've created this. The world is fine, by the way. Look out there. Just look around. The world is not overwhelmed. It's just fine. It's only how we're engaged with that and you know how we're engaged with our commitments about it that then creates the, the stress, the problem the take up the mental real estate, the creative real estate that's then not available for the cool stuff. You turned on a light bulb for me with this idea of, of becoming a victim of the things that are in your world, because, you know, one of the, 
big barriers to to making creative work happen is this idea that uh, Stephen Pressfield called the resistance so well, and it, but it can it can cause you to to put blame on others or, or 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 pretend like you don't have control over certain things so that you can feel better about not accomplishing what you want to accomplish. And so the next action is one way to to help smooth that path. Sure. And Stephen was so prescient, you know, in his book. I know Stephen and you know, he's a great guy and, and I love The War of Art. I mean, it's an absolutely fabulous book. And the truth is you will resist the things that are most sensitive and real to you because you're going to have to show up you know, to be kind of who you are. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's the conflict between the ego and the self, right? Your ego, yeah. your, your true self wants to get out, but your ego wants to protect you like like a like a blanket on the couch or something like, well, the ego has a job and the job is basically protection. And the job, the the greatest human fear is the fear of being out of control. Now you didn't wake up this morning, David and go, God, I can't wait to be an incompetent jerk today. I'm just going to go screw up. (laughs) I don't think that, I don't think that was your motivator to get out of bed. And what people hate and, and, and fear most is feeling like, I, I don't want to be out of control. I mean, control is the master addiction, really. I'm trying to control the world. I'm trying to keep mm. things stable. I don't, you know, oh my God, you know, I got to, I got to you know, keep things, you know, as controlled as I can. Kind of letting go of that, but being willing to say, well, wait a minute. The reason most people uh, procrastinate is because they, they feel like I'm not sure how to start on my budget. I'm not sure how to start on fixing this relationship. I'm not sure how to start on changing my job. I'm not sure how to start on this painting. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here right now, you know, I've just started to do acrylic painting and I'm staring at an easel. Okay. Shit. Okay. I should put a, a base coat on it. I really should. You know, so, you know, <laughs> so I'm here grappling with, okay, don't feel out of control, David. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to know exactly what you're going to paint on that canvas that you're staring at right now, but you do need to put a base coat on it. And gray would probably be a good neutral color to start with. So, you know, we all grapple with this all the time. But learning how, sort of learning what that dynamic is and then learning how to get more discreet, you know, about what are the, how, how do I engage my physical activity and my, and my attention and my focus, you know, on the, in the real time here in such a way that I could do it with a control thing. It does not take much effort for me to go mix some, some, some white and black and make some gray and do a base coat on this thing. That's not hard. You know, I don't, it, I freak myself out if I think, well, what am I going to be? It's going to be wonderful. And you know, you know, you know. So I have to, I have to, I have to eat my own dog food here. I, I, I still have to hold myself down to don't feel out of control, David, just take a next step. You know, what is that? And with with creative work, especially, I think you have to deal with. It sounds like you were struggling with perfectionism there. In oh, a sure, way. sure. Well, perfectionism just says I need to feel like I can engage with something in control of it. You know, you don't you don't need to necessarily feel that I'm going to make something perfect. I just need to make sure that I'm taking the right next step, and I'm in control of that. I'm in the driver's seat of moving toward whatever might be perfection. So interestingly, it's the, it is the perfectionism, but perfectionism simply because what you do is you run ahead in your brain and try to imagine perfection uh, as opposed mm-hmm. to you know, focus yourself on, wait a minute, let me just take a next step you know, and then see what shows up. This is one of the things I've noticed with people as I talk to them about creative work and that I've noticed in myself and I'm always trying to combat is that when you start a creative endeavor, you have a tendency to envision this incredible masterpiece and like the very, uh, the very image of that masterpiece in your mind intimidates you from even starting. Sure. Well, you know, it's back to writer's, you know, admonition called write a shitty first craft. You know, that's the, that's the first thing to do is sit down, just butt in chair, boot computer, hit key. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And, you know, we all resist that because it has to be perfect or I need to whatever. And thank God for Charles Simonia, who built Word, that we could actually write stuff and then figure out what to do with it later once we wrote it. So back to GTD, uh, it's, if there, if our listeners were to try some of our listeners who haven't tried GTD or who, who want to review, which I would recommend reviewing, um, if they were to try something that just took a few minutes to give, to give them a taste of this system, what would they do? 
easy. Uh, take a pen and paper, you know, no batteries, no Wi-Fi required, and jot down the first 10 things that come to your mind that you need to handle, deal with, think about, decide about, you know, whatever. Uh, anybody who's been listening to this this far has probably had their mind go somewhere else that had nothing to do with what you and I were talking about. <laughs> so that's a place to start. Hey, grab that. You know, what's that thing? Write it down. And then, you know, once you've written those top 10 things or the first 10 things that pop into your head that you need to handle, deal with, think about, whatever, then go through each one of them one at a time very cleanly and clearly and say, what's the very next action I would need to take to get closure on this? if I need to take an action at all and then make that decision and write down those action steps and then watch what happens to your psyche. That's I, all you have to do. I think where a lot of people get tripped up and because what you're talking about is very simple, but I think that what trips up a lot of people is they might be like, Oh, that's just a to do list. But the problem with to do lists is that when you're writing it down, when most people are writing a to do list, they're writing down like things that they need to do. They're not doing the next action for one, but then they're also, as they're writing it, like psychologically making a commitment to do that thing. But one of the magical things about GTD is that as you're writing it down, you aren't making a commitment to do the thing. Right. No, I throw away about 80% or 90% of the notes that I take. It's just getting I it out there don't. so you can triage it. Yeah, absolutely. I just don't, I don't know which 90%. They're all brilliant when I have them <laughs> as ideas. Yeah, but oftentimes it's half of, half way through a bottle of you know good you know you know Italian wine, and I go and the next morning I go, <laughs> you know Not a can't chance. even read it <laughs> can't even read it much less yeah okay what what did that mean but the but the point is I got it out and I got it in there and you know some of the coolest things that I've created in my life started as harebrained crazy ass ideas mm. that I had you know at dinner. And I just wrote it down because I carry around a little notepad and a pen with me everywhere. Uh, you, you mentioned the notepad and the pen. And you mentioned writing everything down with a, on a pen and paper. And actually, I was uh, on my Facebook uh, page. I was asking if any people had any questions for you. And one, one of the questions that came up was, was about like the paper and the filing system. A lot of people who are listening are, they might be digital nomads or minimalists and stuff. And they're not really, they don't want to have the filing cabinet and, or, or it's impractical for them to have it. Do you have any opinions on, um, you know what getting things done has been been out for Fine. so Fine. long where's, and, their, yeah. uh, where's their passport where's their passport where's their passport uh mine's in my lockbox yeah so you have a physical thing in a physical place that's organized by physical stuff so you know until you get until money where's where's the where's your u.s dollars by the way when you go up to the u.s um that is in my in my bank account and I, oh, I have, you don't you, you don't have any physical dollars. Oh, I, I've, I've, I've got a few in my backpack. Yeah, you're right. Oh, okay, so <laughs> you're still in a physical world. You know, come mm -hmm. on. You know? So, so your uh, opinion on like so, the technology, um, you know, GTD organization systems that no, are no. software and stuff is that is that it's I'm a I'm a total minimalist. Yeah, where's the least amount of effort I can? You know, what am I going to try to do? Try to try to scan all of my passport pages. <laughs> Are you kidding? You know, and then produce that when I go through the, I, I don't think so. Right. So yeah, I'm a total minimalist. What's the, what, you know, I, and I have a folder called, you know, money international. Cause when I go to Bulgaria, I need their money. And when I go to the UK, I need, I need British pounds. And it, you always come back from these places with extra money. You that didn't wind up changing. It wasn't worth changing in the airport, but nice to have them in your pocket. So that when you go back and get a taxi without having to go to the ATM machine. Right. So, right. So you, you, so I'm a total minimalist. It's just, don't kid yourself. If you say, oh, I'm not going to keep any papers, like, well, grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so what you're saying is that, uh, is you still, you still feel that a paper physical organization system is necessary to, to do GTD correctly? Oh, well, it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here looking at receipts, you know, for my business or whatever. They're on my, I'm sitting here in Amsterdam in my little home office and looking at a stand up file thing that has, you know, receipts from 2017 from the two different businesses that I'm in. 
So what am I going to do? At some point, I've been tasked by my accountants to pull up another version of that receipt. And yeah, I, it was scanned. It was somewhere else, but kind of nice to have the physical version of that. I mean, I've got stuff that I had to print out for my email because I, I might have to talk to somebody about the place that I'm renting. And you know, there's just stuff, you know, come on. You, you know, maybe if you're 22, you could make everything digital, but wait till you get a life. <laughs> but I think one of your, I think one of your warnings about the digital stuff was that, um, it doesn't, it, it's out of your, it's out of your sight. Like you put it in that digital capture system and then you either need to have a, a, a bulletproof trigger to go retrieve that. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, well, come on. It, it's still somewhat labor intensive mentally that you have to go, where do I need to go to get this that I need mm -hmm. for that kind of thing? You know, come on, I'm an Evernote user like you. So, you know, I, I, that's, that's all my digital checklist. That's my wine list. That's whatever, you know? And so, yeah, it doesn't matter where it is, but the fact that you make a distinction between digital and paper is just stupid. Right. Well, which is the easiest way to keep track of that? Oftentimes I will print out stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm, I've got a client I'm doing a keynote uh, speech for in a couple of weeks in the U.S. And I've printed out their stuff, which is the agenda they have for their meetings, et cetera. That's a whole lot easier to have in my hand than to try to go find on a computer when I need to, when I'm on the plane and I'm looking at, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. where do I need to be exactly when? And have that in my hands as well as I print out still paper-based uh, every single travel document that I need, you know, airlines, hotels or whatever. Because uh, I don't trust, I don't trust the digital, you know, uh, iPhone. I've seen too many people stand there and just get a heart attack trying to get their stuff up on their iPhones. Well, what happens you know? when you pick up an iPhone? Oftentimes, is that there's some notification on there. You're, you're picking it up with the intention of going to retrieve something or going to capture something, put it in one of your inboxes, and then there's this text message there, and you start <laughs> thinking about that. Yeah, I know. Come on. So, yeah, it will get there. I mean, I'd say 10 years from now, you probably don't won't need much paper for much of anything, you know. But and I probably am using 10 percent of the paper that I used 15 years ago. You know, so yeah, it's going that direction for sure. Sometimes but, I consider but, having like a separate uh, device, like not, not the iPhone, like the, an i, what is it, like an iPod Touch that doesn't have any messaging or anything on it, and it's just for organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that'd be cool. That if you could trust it. But what happens when the battery goes down? Mm. Yeah. Going back to the uh, the creative work. In the creative energy, I'm curious about, like for yourself, when you wrote Getting Things Done, you hadn't written a book before, correct? Um, and you had, you, you've been doing this stuff as, consult, as a consultant 20 or 25 years. Um, what did that, how did you use GTD to write GTD? Uh, to give me, you know, it took me about a year or a year and a half or two years to really learn that I needed four hours of uninterrupted time to be able to get back into the book writing without stepping on my own toes and rewriting stuff and, and, and being off. And boy, that was agonizing to try to get that. Cause you know, I'd be, I'd have a breakfast meeting with a client. I'd do a stand up seminar all day. I'd have a, a dinner meeting with a client. I'd be on a plane for two hours, like, assuming that I could write the next chapter. It's like, <laughs> come on, David, you know, grow up. You know, that I needed really a, a fresh energy and a good space of time to be able to move into the context to be able to then keep writing the book. So that took a, a long time for me to learn that. And once I learned that, then it was like, relax, unless I have that kind of time, don't put any pressure on myself. And then look forward to say, when can I have those kinds of time frames and then block those out, you know, to be doing that kind of work. So early on you were thinking, oh, I can, I can go ahead and do all these things, going to meetings and workshops and et cetera. And I'll just write the book in, in the time in between. Um, and then I mean, how did that process of discovering go for you? Well, I was became an alcoholic. I mean, writing a book about stress-free productivity. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, my God, you know, it's like, this was tough stuff, you know, because it, as you know, come on, David, to write, you have to think thinking is tough work. Yes. And you can only do so much thinking in a day. <laughs> About four hours, they've assumed. I mean, from the research that I've seen. The Anders Ericsson study. 
I, I don't know whose it was, but I, I know from several places I've seen about four hours is max that you could do that kind of thinking or concentration or attention focus uh, without just letting your brain relax. And, and what about like the, you know, the, the, the alinearity, if that's a, I think it's a word, alinearity of creative work. Like you, you, you would like to think that, oh, well, I'm going to write a book. So what I'll do is I'll write the outline and then I'm going to write this chapter and then I'm going to write that chapter. I'm going to write this chapter. And as, as I assume it goes for you, it doesn't actually go that way. Um, was there a learning curve for figuring out how to, uh, how to tease out you that know, creative work uh, and what the steps were? What were the, what was the next action? Well, you know, I use mind manager and mind mapping for a lot of things that I think about. So I'm just grabbing ideas here or there everywhere and not wanting to lose any idea that I might have that might be relevant. So mind mapping is a, is a great way to make sure that happens. When I started to write the book, it took me a little while to realize that what I needed was two word docs. One word doc was the outline and the other word doc was just writing or whatever. And I needed both. I couldn't, you know, trying to, trying to turn a word doc into an outline, given that they, you know, make that available to be able to do that was just too much mental work to try to make that work. So I just found it made it a whole lot easier just to make two documents. Mm -hmm. One was my blueprint essentially as best I could see it that I wanted to fill in the blanks. And the other was just start filling the blanks and start writing, you know, and then see what happens, see where that goes. And then could go back and forth between those to see, you know, okay, well, wait a minute, let me fill in some more here. And that, that, that was my best formula for writing the book. And, and so it took you a while to discover that. Yeah, it did. Um, and, and so, so you, you needed these, big blocks of uninterrupted time to, to do that. I'm just trying to think about, um, again, this, this idea of a linearity, it, were you able to, to do that writing, um, into that, in that one word doc and feel like you were making something productive or yeah. uh, was it, yeah, uh, it gave, painful it gave experience? Me, it gave, no, no, it gave me the freedom to write whatever I felt like I was writing. Mm. You know, I have an aha and let me just write this out as a paragraph. I, and later on, I'll figure out where that paragraph goes. And, 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 you know, where it needs to be. I'm writing right now an article for, you know, a friend of mine's, you know, publishing a book that asked me to write, uh, you know, a chapter on it. So I've, I've started that writing and basically I just started writing and it's not going to be that complicated, a, a you know, a, a, an essay essentially. So I've just started writing, but again, that's the magnificence of, of the digital, you know, uh, word processors. It's like they let you have ideas later on to figure out where they go. So you sitting down and just giving myself the freedom to just write an idea out and then, you know, do double, you know, click, 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 you know, and then another idea, write it out, click, 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 click. Editing is really the art of writing, you know, uh, you know, so you write the crappy first draft and then come back and then look at what you've done and then see what shows up there from a higher altitude and then start to then reformat that. So. You know, God bless again, Charles and whatever the folks that created Word, you know, that you could do that. So to me, that's the that's the essence of at least the literary process. We're going to take a quick break to live a balanced life and do your best work. You've got to sleep well. You also need to eliminate hassles, hassles like shopping for a mattress. Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress for a shockingly fair price that you can get delivered to your door with no hassles. It combines supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. And with over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, Casper is quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. And I'm one of those happy customers. I had a Casper when I lived in Chicago, and if I lived in the U.S. again, I would immediately order another Casper. Casper is designed, developed, and assembled in the United States, and Casper has free shipping and returns to the United States and Canada. Try Casper for 100 nights, risk-free, in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash love it. Use the promo code love it. Terms and conditions apply. Decision fatigue is real. You know Steve Jobs wore the same thing every day. You know Mark Zuckerberg wears the same thing every day. The more you have to worry about your clothes, the less mental energy you have to worry about other things. 
which is why I love my minimalist shirt from Pistol Lake. It's so versatile. The fabric is soft. It's stretchable. It's wrinkle-free and stink-free. I wear it to the gym. I just wore it on a night out to see a play. I'm going to wear it this weekend watching whales off the coast of Columbia. Pistol Lake has worked so hard on these shirts. They've spent two years just engineering their magical U-Day yarn. It's a blend of recycled bottles and eucalyptus tree pulp. And Pistol Lake makes all of their clothes right in the USA. Go to pistollake.com slash loveyourwork now and pick up their minimalist shirt. They're going to give Love Your Work listeners 10% off with the promo code LOVEYOURWORK. You can wear it for 100 days. If you don't love it, they'll refund it, no questions asked. They'll even recover your return shipping. That's pistollake.com slash loveyourwork. Use the code LOVEYOURWORK. Yeah, it sounds to me like um, you were well equipped to recognize, how, you know how how tightly to grip each step of the process because of your GTD um, training, for lack of a better word, I guess being the inventor of GTD. Uh, well, so, yeah. well, let me stop you there, David. I mean, come on, I, I, I'm literally before I got on this Skype call with you, you know, I was cleaning up my email to zero so that I could then work on this article. So some people say, you know, and everybody's got their own rhythm about this. And I think everybody needs to kind of discover what that is for themselves. Um, some people say, I just need to write from eight o'clock till 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, and they get up and write and they have that kind of discipline. So it sounds like you might be that kind of guy that says, Hey, I have a methodology that, that, that works in that way. I don't, the only thing I do rhythmically is wake up, and I barely do that rather regularly. So you know, my point of view is let me just clean the deck. As soon as I get the deck clear, then I'll decide what I feel like doing, and then you know that's what I want to do. So in a way, it's kind of avoiding thinking because I just sit there and down and deal with the business of my life but get that cleaned up. But that makes it a whole lot easier in a way to then give myself permission and freedom to just hang out and go, you know, paint my acrylics or write on this article or whatever, because there's nothing else pulling to me that I should have need to had to deal with. I know how to deal with those things fast and get a clean backlog. And I think that's the, for me, that's the coolest place to operate from is with no backlog. And I feel like this, uh, this idea of battling the perfectionism becomes important. Like if you're doing a mind map, to be okay with, oh, this mind map is, I'm just doing a mind map. I'm not trying to make a product that's that's perfect at this point. While you're doing the outline, you feel that way. While you're doing the writing, like you were saying, editing is the magic of writing. And so recognizing that and being and accepting the fact that, uh, that any of the editing is not part of your next action, that instead you are writing and editing is a separate process. I feel like that gives you the mental space to then put forth the creative force to to move forward with with the creative work does that sound accurate to you it does and editing is hard work that really requires thinking at a different kind of level probably from a different part of your brain it mm-hmm. says okay wait a minute you know interestingly david when i first wrote getting things done back in you know 98 99 um we did two line edits of that book, both to make it evergreen so that we got rid of, we sort of stripped out all the business buzzwords or the time-based buzzwords that, so we could make this more of an evergreen book. But I was so fascinated because I was scared to begin with that a line editor with somebody like Penguin, you know, big, big company like that, might screw up my voice. Mm. But was, what was fascinating is they actually enhanced my voice. It's kind of like, as I say, they, they gave my prose a shower. <laughs> they took something I said in 25 words. They said it in 12 better than I would have said it, but that's the way I would have said it now that I see it. So it was fascinating to give myself the permission to let go of that kind of control. And so what I did was I actually retyped my manuscript uh, based upon line edits so that I could learn how they think. Man, that changed a whole lot about how well I write. I wasn't a bad writer to begin with, but 
that really helped me skinny it down to get, wait a minute, get much more to the essence of what you're trying to say. And I think getting to essence and simplifying is the, you know, is the elegance of any kind of artistic craft. Mm -hmm. And there's this element of, um, there's this part in the book where you're talking about the, the perfect, when you have some time and you just decide it's time to do some things, there's the context, you know, maybe you're in your garage, maybe you're in your office and you have your phone available and things like that. There's, there's the amount of time that you have, maybe a 15 minutes, maybe you have an hour. And then there's the mental energy that you have left over. Um, and that's, that part really fascinates me, this, this idea of mental energy, because I don't know what it's like for you and it'd be interesting to know, but do you have predictable fluctuations in your mental energy or in your creative energy? <laughs> Consistently, yeah. They're, 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 you know, do I feel like, uh, you know, going and buying flowers and organizing them in a Ikebana vase, or do I feel like writing this kind of thing? So, it, yeah, no, it's it's um, that's interesting. Well, by you know, consistent, to to, I mean, you know, is it like oh, around eight, you know, between eight and ten in the morning, it's really good for me to do this sort of stuff? No, no, not for you at all. I'm none of that. No. Because I travel a lot, and you know time zones and mm, yeah. all that stuff. It's kind of like I, I, I really don't. Um, and you know, a lot of that has to do with probably where I am, you know, and and what's the nature of what is it that I'm trying to do. Some things I want to have a glass of wine before I sit there and try to paint. Some things I need to first thing in the morning. I need to deal with this bank thing that just showed up. Oh my god, they just transferred my thing, and now I can't wire stuff. And I, jeez, oh, you know. And so, a lot of times it's the business of the business of life that I try to handle first to get that off my consciousness, oh. and then and then you know then sort of snack the rest of the day on email or or playing with artistic stuff. I mean, so do you feel like a lot of times you're you're working as an executive, um, so that you can get the, so you can actually make some time for painting? Of course, yeah. You know, I'm I'm a lone kind of guy. I mean, I don't have an assistant. You know, my wife manages her own stuff. I just manage my own calorie. I manage everything. So I have to play off the. Here's my operational side of my game, and here's my executive side of my game, and here's my creative, you know, harebrained side of the game. And I just have to pay attention to which one of those I can serve at which point that, that works the best. And what about GTD for uh, big life decisions and projects such as, say, your move to Amsterdam? How did you use GTD to um, decide that that was even something to think about, to do the thinking about it, to make the decision Oh my God, it's, it, of course, the whole thing, you know, it was on someday, maybe, oh, let's move to Europe. You know, at some point we said, okay, now that's an active project. Where do we go? And then making decisions about, you know, what, okay, which city do you go to? Well, how did it go from someday, uh, maybe to being an active project? <laughs> it's good. So, you take one off one list and you put it on the other. No, I mean, was that, were you doing a weekly review one time or you had, you had, uh, made an X action to brainstorm about what it would be like, whether you wanted to do it or you just kind of woke up one day and you're like, yeah, it's not someday maybe anymore. I'm going to do that. Yeah. That, that, the latter. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Just wake up. Cold. Okay. It's time. See the, the stuff you put in these systems, David, I mean, your, your GTD systems of the lists, they're not your life. Come on, your life is much more complex and, and, and intricate and subtle and sublime than anything you'd put on that list. I don't care what it is. But having the things on the list gets you to think at those levels as you review it. So sitting back and looking at that, I'm saying, okay, God, where are we going? Okay, you know, here's a project now, research where to move in Europe. You know, and that became a project. But just looking at those kind of things gets you to think at those kind of levels that most people won't have the discipline to do unless you train yourself to look at these lists on a regular basis and then have those generate whatever thoughts are generated by doing that. So it's not the list. It's the thinking mm -hmm. that they trigger, that they trigger. That's important. Well, and then the, the system also has uh, sort of horizons, you know, 50,000 feet or... 5,000 yeah. feet. And I mean, I imagine that would be, you know, relatively higher horizon, maybe not all the way up there, but, um, you're reminded you have triggers to, to think about those things on a regular basis. 
Yeah. And we all do that all the time anyway. All I did was start to recognize and identify what are these different horizons that, that, that generate, you know, our thinking and our priorities. So I didn't make those up. Mm-hmm. I just, I just recognize them. You know, and at some point, you know, if your life partner comes home and says, gee, dear, I've just been given a major career opportunity, but we're going to have to move to Afghanistan for a couple of years. Trust me, you will, <laughs> you're going to have a dinner conversation that's going to be at a much higher horizon than buy cat food, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Right. You're going to be, wait a minute, what are we doing with our lives? Is this the lifestyle we want? You know, where does that fit into the larger game in terms of what we're doing? So everybody's in these levels and in these levels of game. I just started to identify and make them objectified so that if you actually start to think about them in more conscious and maybe proactive ways, then, you know, it tends to line yourself up and, you know, create some cooler stuff that makes things happen that you want to have happen. Yeah, having the framework there gives you something to to grab on and gives your your thoughts some context. Indeed. Uh, and when you wrote Getting Things Done, you had, as I said, been consulting, uh, looking over people's shoulders, going to their offices, helping them, uh, watching as they clean out their files and everything for 20 or 25 years. Um, how did How did you start consulting? I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. You know, I was looking for God, truth, and the universe, and, you know, was a history major in UC Berkeley in 1968, dropped out of school because that wasn't handling it for me, and and I didn't know what I wanted to do, sort of into personal exploration, but they weren't paying people to do that, so I had had to keep a job. But I had friends who knew what they wanted to do, so I wound up being a good number two guy. So I helped a lot of people, a lot of my friends, start and sort of structure their own businesses. And so um, I just walk in and go, well, how much easier could we do this? You know, now you know, I help friends build a restaurant. I help a guy run a landscape company. I, you know, I just all kinds of stuff. But it, uh, now they call that process improvement. I just said, well, how can we be lazy here? <laughs> so I don't have to work so hard. <clears throat> and what can I do to help them with their systems? I mean, and then you- I discovered that, they they pay people to do that, and they call them something called consultant. You know, wow. So, nineteen eighty one, I hung out my shingle and became. I said, okay, let me start my own little consulting practice to do that kind of stuff. At the same time, I had had the experience in the martial arts and my own spiritual practices of how cool it was to have a clear head, and the freedom to be able to have nothing on your mind. You know, in the martial arts, that's critical for people jumping in a dark alley. You don't want two thousand unprocessed emails sitting in your psyche. So <laughs> the, the, both the deliciousness of a clear space, at the same time having a, my own consulting practice and then discovering my world was getting more complex and then finding, well, wait a minute, this clear space seems to be a nice place to operate from in terms of people being more productive. And so as I began uncovering techniques for myself, turned around and used them with my clients and friends, and they all work for them too. Oh, wow, that's cool. Getting more clear space allow them to focus more meaningfully and be more stable and be more, you know, focused on what they were doing. And going, wow, that's really cool. So I cobbled together a whole lot of these practices back then in the eighties and then had somebody in a large corporate world show up and say, gee, David, we need that result in our culture. So he asked me, could I design a training, you know, around this methodology that they could deliver to, you know, a whole lot of people in a big corporate culture. I said, well, We'll see. So I spent two or three months, you know, in 1983-84 working with his his team to design a two and a half day training around, okay, what I had uncovered would call how do you keep clear, how do you get, you know, how do you get focused on the meaningful stuff? And that was, you know, kind of the, <laughs> the, the I went, wow. I, I was not, you know, I had no experience in the business world or the corporate world or the training world. I just learned what I'd learned. But it turned out that it hit a nerve. And then it took me 25 years to figure out that what I'd figured out was unique. <laughs> Nobody else had done it. And, you know, after, you know, lots of years and thousands of hours of working with, you know, people and executives and companies, you know, with this material, that's when I decided to write the book. So Sorry. that's a very short version of a very <laughs> long story, David. So yeah. do you have any mm, theories on why they came to you? Uh, you know. Any entrepreneur, any startup is going to feel out of control. They're wearing too many hats. They're, they're, they're trying to handle too many things, 
have so many different things I need to manage and deal with. And so, you know, most of those folks are feeling somewhat out of control. So trying to get that on stable ground so that they could, you know, move more forward was, uh, you know, pretty much prime desire. And I mean, it sounds like, so you, you dropped out of college, you, you weren't sure what you wanted to do. Um, was there like a lot of exploration that went on during that time? And if, if so, do you feel like that equipped you um, with the mind that could think of something that was uh, original? Uh, gee, David, that's a loaded question. I, I, I actually, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I just was bumped around kind of putting one foot from the other, just trying to pay the rent and you know, keep, have a good job and not have to work for anybody else. So do you have any theories about like what components of your personality or, or your experiences kind of came together to, to make getting things done happen? Like, you know, why, why, why you? <laughs> I've always been fascinated by models and I've always been fascinated by the invisible and how it affects the visible. Mm. So, you know, I, I've known from early on, at least intuitively, that there were things we couldn't see that were affecting how we perceived things, how we performed, how we saw things, how we, you know, whatever, and what we did. And so trying to get a hold of that. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, what's this thing we can't see? And, you know, we didn't even have that word for it. But then, I, you know, in my early college years, I, I got turned on to intellectual history, history of thought. And I read um, Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, which was an incredible book about cultures and the cultures have their own lifestyle they have their own life uh, cycle and they have their own paradigms and belief systems you know why do the greeks not have zero why did the gothic culture in the western culture you know have infinity as something so uh, fascinating to see when you st- and i began to we didn't call it they didn't have that word back then we didn't use paradigms as a word back then but now it's pretty common you know, commonplace. But the fact that your belief system is affecting perception and form of performance all the time. So I've always been fascinated by that. And then how, how, if you got a hold of that, how you could see things you hadn't seen before, how you could make things happen with as little effort as possible you hadn't seen before. How, you know, how do you, how do you do that? How do you get a hold of that without having to work hard? Cause I'm a lazy guy basically. So I figured if you could get a hold of what's invisible and how that's affecting everything we're doing and get a, a grip on that and how it works, you'd have the master key. So that's, that's, that's been pretty much my driver, at least as soon as I became conscious of that, you know, back, you know, back in my college years, probably where I started to think about it in that way. But my first job was a magician at age five, you know, on the, on the sidewalk in Palestine, Texas. You know, Hi. You know, let me show you da da da, and so I've always been fascinated by that sort of magic of wait a minute, there's stuff you can't see, mm-hmm. and let's make let's make some cool stuff happen if you get a hold of that. I mean, I, I feel like there's a, a kind of a tangibility bias to the world that there are objects in front of us and conversations and things all about us all the time, and because of that, we can't actually see the what organizes all of that. Yeah, probably. Um, and when you started doing the consulting and started, they, you said you didn't have the the corporate experience. Uh, did you have to? In what ways did responding to that challenge change you? Well, come on, David. If you've ever written anything, it, it educates you to write it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just standing out there and talking, it's like, you know, the, the late, great Buckminster Fuller, he always said, look, he, and he, he spoke to groups almost till his last day of his life. And he said, because but by speaking to groups, I have a, my own BS meter internally that when I'm speaking to groups, the BS meter will go on or off and then I learn what I know, but I only do that by talking to people. So I think that was a lot of my path was I just had to start (laughs) doing this stuff, talking about it, uh, you know, coaching people on this stuff and working and then finding out what I learned as I was doing that process. So I had to be engaged. Were there any key things that uh, maybe you had misconceptions about in the beginning that you learned as you started practicing about 
you know, what you thought about the system? No. No, from the very beginning, I, I kind of caught, wait a minute, this is all about unloading stuff off your head, deciding next actions about them, parking results in trusted systems. So almost from the very beginning, I started to realize and saw, you know, how powerful that process was in terms of freeing up your mental and creative energy. So, so I didn't have any missteps about that. I just had unconsciousness that then I became conscious about it. Well, was the challenge then um, getting so you could communicate it to people in a in a way that oh, they yeah. would actually Im- implement it? Oh, yeah. I figured it took me 25 years to figure out what I'd figured out. Wrote the book, hit a nerve. People read the book and transformed their lives. So I said, okay, I, I did create a virtual version of this. And I figured that I'd take the rest of my life to figure out how to transmit this to people to get it to stick. And I'm not the expert at that. So I'm, that's what I'm involved in now. So, okay, guys. How do we get the 7 billion people on this planet to essentially have no problems, but only projects? And that's, that's my mission. At what point did it become getting things done? Oh, I got 740 used titles. I'll sell you cheap, David. You know, so it was when you were writing the book or was it while <laughs> yeah, you were consulting? Yeah, oh, okay. you know, we, we trying to figure out oh, how do we title this thing? And, you know, initially back in 2000 and 2001, when the book was first published, you know, the target market were really the high, uh, you know, the, the high potential fast track professionals because they were the ones who were being first bombarded and, 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 ex- and were exploding with the email, you know, plethora of, of stuff that was showing up out there. And, and they were the ones who were most interested in, in getting the result of getting the, the pressure off of them about that. So, you know, the, the first edition of the book was really targeted for that kind of person. So getting it, getting things done. And, you know, the strange secret of this is getting things done is really not about getting things done. It's about getting appropriately engaged with your, your commitments in your life so that you feel that you're present with whatever you're doing, which is the most productive state to operate from. But the truth is, if you're here on the planet to get things done, then you need to be appropriately engaged with being able to get things done. You know, you need to define what done means and what doing looks like and where it happens. And most people have avoided that process. So it, interestingly, what it, you know, what I uncovered was something that, you know, what you need to do to get things done is actually what you need to do to get your head clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, simply because you're getting, you're, you're engaging with your own commitments with yourself in an appropriate way. This is a common thing in, in I think, books and I- ideas is that, uh, the book might be about one thing, but the thing that the people want is the result of that thing. And so the book is kind of titled that way. Um, do you remember any of the potential titles that there were for getting things done? Oh, one was, uh, Zen, the art of in basket maintenance. Mm. Okay. <laughs> play on uh, Zen and the article. But it, was, it was too much of a play on the, on the, on the other book. So, but there was that, you know, Otherwise, no, nothing comes to mind. Nothing we, else comes to mind. No, uh, no, we, we grapple with a lot. There, you didn't think of uh, appropriately engaging with the things around you. <laughs> no, appropriate engagement was really something that showed up a few years later. I said, well, wait a minute, that's really what it's about. Oh, that's what, so you discovered after the fact, after writing the book, and maybe you were yeah. reviewing it or talking to somebody and somebody said yeah. something. Well, the new, the new edition of the book that came out, you know, that I did in, in 2015, talks about appropriate engagement because that was something that I really sort of learned or recognized, you know, since the first edition of what this was really about. Getting things done is probably a better title because, you know, that's what people want. Um, even though the appropriate engagement is what you needed to, to get things done. Right. Right. And what were, when you were first starting, uh, building, getting things done, what were kind of the prevailing productivity, what was the prevailing productivity wisdom? What were people doing to stay productive in, in that world in the early 80s, late 70s? Well, that was when time management sort of hit a buzz, you know, out there in the, certainly in the corporate training world or whatever. And that's when Franklin Covey and, uh, and the daytimer and, you know, and, and planners and all that stuff started to show up. And, you know, daily to-do lists and prioritizing and all that stuff kind of showed up as a, you know, the, the time management world. Um, really happened then. That's why I wasn't sure whether the book was going to be successful or not, because it was quite a noisy world by the time that was published in 2001. 
you know, all that stuff or, you know, personal organizing, prioritizing, you know, you know, you know to yada, yada. I mean, there was just a huge amount of stuff out there. So I had high anticipation, but no expectation that anybody would recognize how unique getting things done was against all that other stuff. Well, you were responding to new, um, I mean, whether this was your intention or not, I I think that getting things done was responding to new demands. Um, Just the, I mean, I I think that's why people started managing their time was because they became knowledge workers and it wasn't like, okay, go to the fields and uh, move these boxes or uh, or pick these crops. Uh, you actually have to. You're an accountant. You have to see. You have to see clients, and now you have to figure out where you're going to put them in your schedule and what you're going to when you're going to do all the other stuff you need to do. And then early 2000s, as the internet is is um, swelling, and then there's this overwhelming surge of things in people's lives. Inputs, right? Well, that's the stress of opportunity. Yeah. If you were in a crisis, you know, uh, you get to relax because you don't have any choices. You need to live. So the the problem is, is when there's no crisis, that's a bigger crisis because now all the demons at the gate are rushing through there. Oh, wow, my God, my kids could take this seminar. And I, the neighbors, the, and but my God, their kids are four years old. They're going to get into Harvard because they're taking this Mozart seminar, you know, and then, yeah, yeah, what am I going to do? Oh, my God. <laughs> so. You know, yes, yes. So the plethora of opportunity that this 24 seven, always on digitally connected to the world world has given us is to some degree, a large, a large part of the sources of stress. And what's the last book that you read that changed the way that you saw something? Hmm. Uh, the secret life of trees. Or the hidden life of trees. What's uh, anything? Any good tidbits from that one? Anything exciting that you learned? I'll never see a tree again the same way. Fascinating. Uh, Forrester in Germany wrote the book. It's a great book, by the way, about how trees communicate with each other, how they're all connected in interesting ways. Fascinating. And you know, then you're dealing with five, six, seven hundred year old you know, life cycles. So seeing things in that way. And then, you know, it was just a fun read. Didn't necessarily change my life in any way other than, well, but it changed the way you saw something. And that's that's the important thing. It's one of those, uh, more invisible forces organizing the world. Indeed. Um, do you have a final message for our listeners to sum up our conversation that we've had today? Your head's for having ideas, but not for holding them. All right, great. And where can people get more of you? Um, Gettingthingsdone.com. You can see all that. And my book, the new edition of Getting Things Done, is wherever you get good books. So you can find it there. Great. David, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a huge honor to talk to you for a whole hour today. And I'm sure the the listeners feel the same way. My pleasure, David. Thank you very much. I hope that conversation with David Allen helps you make space for your very best creative thinking. Organizing and dealing with your email is a huge part of getting things done. If you want to get in control of your email, you should listen to Jocelyn K. Gly on episode 47. Right. The problem is, is that, of course, like, you know, the, the sort of really meaningful work that we do, those are really long tasks, you know, that take weeks, months, or even years. And there's sort of no, you know, built in kind of milestones or little hits of completion that you get for those things. And so I think it's, it's very easy for us to fall into that trap of email. And then you kind of forget to focus on, on our best work, you know, on the stuff that really is going to, is going to bring our lives meaning. Again, Jocelyn is on episode 47. And if you want to get things done, you also have to manage your motivation. Dan Ariely is on episode 51, teaching you what behavioral science can tell you about being productive. If you think that you have two hours of productive hours a day, and on each of those hours you can produce two and a half times to three times more than on these hours after lunch, every minute you waste of those two hours is, is, is a waste. 
Again, Dan is on episode 51. I work hard to help you crack the code on fulfilling work. If Love Your Work is helping you, there are some ways you can help support the show and make it even better. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe. This is especially effective on Apple Podcasts or iTunes because it boosts rankings and helps others find the show. I know many of you listen on Overcast because you're the early adopter types. So even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please subscribe there anyway. Subscribe in your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV, your computer. The more devices, the better. It really helps. Apple Podcast ratings help too. Just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review, and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Elite. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You could even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance, and you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work elite members such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spiderflower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>